Hello and welcome to Scotty Kilmer Live Car Talk Podcast, where I use my 51 years experience to answer all your car questions. I'm here to help everybody on the planet with their car problems, tell you the truth. I love helping people out. Now remember, during the show, ask your questions on the live chat on YouTube, and I'll pick the best ones and answer them. We're going to start out with Hot Amanda Fari. I think Fiat's are more reliable because you can reliably count on them showing up in the mechanic shop frequently. Well, that's a very good point. Now, uh, when I was a young mechanic, Fiat's were known in the mechanics world that I lived in as fix it again, Tony, because you were always fixing it again. And Tony being a common Italian name, people said that. They, they were really the first cars to have extremely horrendous complex electronics. When other cars just had a few fuses, well, Fiat and the Italians, they went to putting relays everywhere. And you were always buying relays because relays are a safety device. But unfortunately, the Italians didn't make them very well. So the relays kept breaking all the time. <laughs> they were terrible cars. And today, they still are relatively terrible cars. They're even talking about pulling out of the United States. They own Chrysler. And of course, they put a lot of their technology into Chrysler cars. But they also do sell some Fiat cars. And they aren't selling worth being. So <laughs> that's a very good point. <laughs> Next question. J.D. Chapman says, Scotty, should I drop a big block in my 94 Jaguar? Well, that's an interesting question. I know guys have done that over the years. Here's the thing. If you like the Jaguar and you want to have it as a toy, go right ahead and drop a big block in it. Because a lot of the Jaguars, hey, they use GM transmissions anyways. So if you put a big block GM V8 in it, it'll bolt right to the transmission. Now there's modifications you have to do, but guys have kits. And then you'll have a big, powerful V8 engine to zoom around it. Now realize then it's no longer a collector's item, but really most 94 Jags aren't collector items anyways. They're really not worth anything. Like, you wouldn't want to take a classic XKE Jag and stuff and put one in, because then it gets rid of the value, because it's no longer a stock Jaguar anymore. But, I mean, let's face it, a 94 Jag, it's not worth that much anyways. And if you want to fiddle around and have fun with it, Ah, realize you're not going to be able to do it and then sell it for a lot of money later because then it lowers the value of the car if it was a collector's. But since it isn't, ah, why not have some fun with it if you want? A lot of guys have done it. Next question. Power Cert Animated Video says, does Scotty do these live shows often? Yes, I do. As a matter of fact, I do them every Thursday at... One o'clock in the afternoon, Central Standard Time. I'm in Texas, Central America, same time zone as Chicago. And I do them Saturdays at 10 a.m. Central Standard Time, where I answer your questions live on YouTube Live. Anybody in the world can watch. And realize that you can just use your phone to ask me questions anywhere on the planet. You don't even need to be hooked up to a computer or anything. Nowadays, hey, they make this stuff easy, and I'm here to help everybody else. So take advantage of it. Tell your friends about it. I used to actually answer every single question that people wrote me on the Internet. I've been doing this for, oh, on TV and then uh, here, and I've been doing it for like 28 years now. So uh, I can't answer everybody's questions individually at a time anymore because I got almost 500 million views so far on YouTube. But... That's why I have these car talks twice a week, so I can help everybody out as much as possible. And the questions are often common. People have the same type of questions, so I can answer, like, thousands of people's questions with one question. Paco44 says, Hey, Scotty's an old man talking about cars. I don't see too many women are going to be watching this. Well, you know, you'd be surprised, because I don't talk down to anybody. If somebody wants to understand how something works, I will go into the basics because a car is a machine. And as such, it was created by man. This isn't like divine intervention, you know, that <laughs> lo and behold, there's Adam and Eve. No, people build these things. So they are made. You can explain how they work. And you can go to any level, basic or high tech. 
And I like helping people out so I can explain it to anybody. So people understand, gee, why do I have to do this? And I don't just say, well, that's a stupid question. Everybody knows that. I'll say, well, here's why. And today, what I found with my own customers is men know just as little as women about most modern cars, especially the younger generation. Uh, uh, they're not like when I was young when guys were fooling around with cars and souping them up. Now, everything's computerized. People just buy a vehicle. Half the young people buy a vehicle because it's got internet connections that they like. <laughs> so, don't poo-poo women. But then again, you're partially right there because... Uh, you know, a lot of women don't even care about cars other than driving them around and they work every time. So, <laughs> but I'll explain it to any woman who wants to know why something isn't working. Next question. Max, I said, should you bother fixing a 2011 Kia Forte because of noises or is it just going to clank and clamor anyway? Okay. It depends whether you have an actual physical problem with that vehicle. So what I always tell people is jack them up in here, pull on the tires, see if there's play and clunk and things that are really worn that can be dangerous and not safe. But if you do that and there isn't really any play, but you get noise, a lot of times you live with it. When I was a kid, all cars had numerous grease fittings. When we changed the oil, we had grease guns, and we would grease all the grease fittings. Some of these cars had like 24 separate grease fittings. It was a job finding them all and greasing them. But for decades, they gave up with all that stuff, and now things are what they call lifetime greased. Yeah, well, when the grease wears out, then they creak and make noises. <laughs> so a lot of times, it's stuff you'll live with, and you won't care. As long as things aren't physically worn, and you see that the tires aren't wearing oddly with cupped wear or anything, on that thing, if you don't find anything when you jack it up, heck, you're probably better off just living with it. Shorty Idaho says, Scotty, it's my birthday today. Well, happy birthday. I'm thinking about buying a used Toyota Prius with a hybrid battery that needs replacing. More shops are making this less expensive. If I'm not doing it myself, what do you think? Well, one, don't do it yourself. You can electrocute yourself. That's high voltage. When you mess with that stuff, you have to have first insulated gloves for electricity, and then you wear another glove inside so the humidity uh, on your hand skin doesn't go through and make it electrically conductive so it's a dangerous thing you got to have expensive equipment here is the problem if it needs a battery and you'll see oh guys do it cheaper yes they do but the way they do it is something that i personally don't believe in the company once gave me a machine that checks that stuff out it would hook up to my laptop and you'd plug it into the Prius. And it spent about an hour running a bunch of tests. Your Prius big battery isn't just one battery. It's actually a bunch of small computer batteries all hooked together. So this machine would check them. It would say, well, this battery pack is gone. This battery pack is gone. You need to replace these two. You take them out. And then you solder new pieces in. But let's say you got... I'm just picking a number. Say you got 40 battery packs all inside this one giant battery. So you change four or five of them. Well, the other ones are old too. Who's to say how long it's going to last? Now I ask these guys that are replacing cheap, what's the warranty? Generally they're going to say, well, you got a year warranty. Well, if you're paying, you know, two, three thousand dollars to have a battery put in and you get a one year warranty, it's a pretty raw deal if you ask me. Realize you buy a brand new one, they last a long time. On those Toyotas, I've seen them last anywhere from 10 to 17 years. The new ones can last a long time. But those rebuilt ones, ah, you're lucky if you get a year or two out of them from my experience. So I'm not a big fan of doing that. Buy a new one if you want. And if the new one costs too much, don't buy the car. <laughs> Next question. Curtis Simpson, Scotty, how is Honda still in business by designing interference motors back in the day while Toyota was making non-interference? Okay, here's the thing about interference engines. Interference engines are where the pistons go real high inside the engine and the valves come down real low. So, if especially you have a timing belt in them, if that belt breaks, then the engine's spinning, say on a highway going 3,500 RPMs, then the pistons are going to hit the valves, bend them, and maybe crack the head, and it's kind of goodbye engine. It's a racing design to get more power. Well, Toyota didn't make too many engines like that in the past. 
because nah, they didn't get that much into the extra power. They wanted reliability. And it worked in their favor because they sold a lot more cars than Honda did. Now, modern cars, though, they're almost all timing chain. They went back to a chain, not a rubber belt. And even a lot of the Toyota engines now are interference engines. But you got a metal timing chain in there, and you don't really care because Toyotas are so well made. If you change the oil often, those chains last so long. I've seen some of them with 400,000 miles, still have the original chains working fine, that you don't really care that it's an interference engine. That's the thing. Now, when they were all timing belts, yes, I would not want a timing belt engine that had an interference engine. But with these modern chains, it eh, doesn't really matter because they last so long. Unless you get a crappy car that the chains break, and then you get problems like uh, some of the Nissans did and have problems with the chains. I would not buy a Nissan for that reason, that they've had timing chain problems. And when they break an interference engine, goodbye engine. Next question. Mojad. Now, Ruzi said, should I get a 1960s Ford Falcon or a Chevy Corvair? Well, you know, that's a toss-up. Depends what you like. The Ford Falcon is a conventional car, front engine. Those things could run forever. You know, the uh, Ford Mustang was basically, the early one was basically a Ford Falcon chassis. And they put a six-cylinder engine in, and then they started to beef on it, became the famous Mustangs. The Chevy Corvair, now that's a completely different ballgame. That is... A six-cylinder boxer engine, like a Porsche, stuck in the back, and it's an air-cooled engine. They're kind of a novelty for American cars. Now, that said, there's this guy in Pennsylvania, and he still makes parts for him. He's got a gigantic business going on there. And people who like those cars, hey, they have some fun with them. You can get one cheap enough, fix it up. They're not that expensive to run. And they're old-fashioned carbureted vehicles, so, you know, they're simple. You don't have to deal with fuel injection and all that nonsense. Sort of what you like. Uh, both of them could be interesting cars. Next question. And I'm there, he says, I got a 95 Mustang GT. The alternator voltage regulator fails when it's tested on the car, passes when tested out of the car. What could it be? It's 5.0 V8, 165,000 miles. Okay. First, if you're having that tested, you want to have it tested by a pro. I'm not talking about just going to one of these discount auto parts stores and they, you know, test it with their equipment, which is relatively cheaply uh, made equipment. It's not high-end stuff. I mean, when I see the guys testing at one of those stores, they use a machine that costs like 200 bucks. When I test them in my garage, I got a machine that costs $1,200. It's a better machine. So you want to make sure that it's being tested by somebody who really knows what they're doing with good equipment. But if they are correct and it tests good out of the car, but then not in the car, that would mean that you have some kind of a wiring problem in the car. That once it's hooked up to the car, if there's a bad enough wiring short in the car, then it will test bad because it's shorting it out so much that it can't put on enough voltage. It's just like uh, uh, years ago. I had an uh, old extension outside, power extension, and things were acting up. And then I looked at it, and I saw, ah, oh, geez, the local squirrels had chewed on the stupid thing. And all I did was buy another extension cord, plugged it into the house, and everything worked again. And that was a wiring short. And that's probably what's going on if the guys tested it right. But you got to make sure it was somebody who knew what they were doing to test it out of the car. Because a lot of those guys don't know what they're doing anymore. Next question. David Kirkpatrick said, should I buy a Generation 1 Volt or a Generation 2? Well, I wouldn't buy one, period, myself. But the Generation 2 ones are a lot better. They got a lot of bugs out of them. Still, I would not buy that particular vehicle myself. Uh, you know, I'm just not into uh, all that technology in my own personal cars because I fix them for a living and I'm a cheap guy. 
and I keep my cards for 20, 30 years or more, and I know that all that electronic stuff, when it does break down, it costs a fortune to fix correctly, like I was just talking about the guy who was thinking about buying a Prius that needed a battery. Yeah, you can get a reconditioned battery cheaper, but how long is it going to last? If you want it to last for 10, 15 years, you're going to have to buy a brand new battery, and then you're going to have to spend six, seven thousand $7,000. So, you know, I'm not into that. I'm not into that in my own personal life. I'm really not into it because I don't like spending money on my own cars. So I'm going to go with something reliable like a Toyota that can go generations and not have to mess around with much stuff. Next question. Fantasy Hider says, Scotty, what do you think of a 1970s Honda Civic CVCC? Okay, those were great cars in those days. Those were revolutionary designs for a small engine to get a lot of horsepower out of them. The customers I had with those cars, they loved them. Now, they're old as the hills. They're in the 70s. But if you can find one like where I am in Texas where they don't rust uh, and the frame's not rotten or anything, they can be a great car. Honda still makes parts for them. You can rebuild them. Uh, those were bulletproof engines in their day for their design. And if you take care of them, and you can still rebuild them because they were still in the 70s, a relatively simple engine. They weren't the really complex stuff that they're putting out today. So yeah, if, especially if you want to get a knock around car to learn how to fix cars or to uh, fix it up because you like them, go right ahead. You can get them pretty cheap. You know, they're not collector's item by any stretch of the imagination. It's not like, you know, a 65 Mustang it goes for a ton. It won't go for that much and they can still go a long way. Next question. That's Gladitude said, hey, Scotty, good evening from Singapore. <laughs> One of my daughters in law is from Singapore. Should one service a car with a turbo, Civic with automatic transmission turbo, more often than a non-turbo? Yes, because turbocharging rams more air into the engine. Same thing as building up the engine, having a higher compression ratio. So the engine puts out more horsepower. You have more horsepower, that's more horsepower going into the transmission. It strains the transmission more. On that particular vehicle, personally, I would change the transmission fluid on that thing every 30, 40,000 miles. Because you don't want to wear out that automatic transmission. Hondas have weak automatic transmissions. They always had. So you want to baby them. And you want to use only the Honda fluid too. That's a big thing with Hondas. Next question. Sean D says, Scotty, how would you go about getting an old MGB to run? It's set for 30 years. Woo wee, 30 years a long time. First thing I would do, okay, it's an old MGB. So, carbureted. First thing I would do is I would take all the spark plugs out. And I'd put some Marvel Mystery Oil. I'd squirt some in each cylinder and I'd let it sit for 24 hours. Then I would get a long cheater bar and a socket, put it on the front of the crank. And I would try to turn that engine over by hand 360 degrees. Because if it only turns a little and then stops, the engine's locked up inside. And then you're going to have to take the whole engine apart. I mean, you could soak it for days then with some uh, of that uh, Marvel Mystery Oil in it. But once you get that, if you do turn it, it goes more than 360 degrees, more in a full circle, and it doesn't bind, then you put a battery in it, get some starting fluid, and see if you can start the thing. Who knows? <laughs> but a lot of times those old English cars, man, they had a lot of steel in them, and they'll just lock right up, right, right up, sitting that long. Especially here in Houston where it's so humid and the humidity just makes the steel rust. I mean, I've seen cars rust here in three years, not 30. <laughs> Next question. Ben Tovar says, is the blue driver a good scan tool for the money? Yes, it is. Uh, the blue driver, these Canadian guys do the software. And it's made in China, but the Canadian guys write the software for it. And for like the $99... It's a good deal because it can do an awful lot for an awful lot of cars. It is a pretty good deal. I'm not that big of a fan of, you know, you plug something in and you're using your phone most of the time because I must have 20 of them here. All these companies send them from China. And most of them don't do diddly squat. I mean, and you can get them from $10 to $150. But the blue driver, huh, I got to say, uh, 
I've got one, and uh, it's pretty impressive for what it does. You know, it doesn't do what my $10,000 scan tools do, but, you know, it does an awful lot for $99. And since it works on your phone, if you ever do have a problem, just leave the little dongle that plugs into the dash, leave it in your glove box or in your trunk or something. So if your check engine light comes on, you can immediately plug it in, put your phone in, see what it says. It's a handy device. Next question. Eric Carabello says, Scotty, should I buy a 2011 or 2016 Scion T-Cylinder 80,000 miles or a 2013 FRS under 75,000 miles? Well, you know, those are well-made cars. I don't know what Toyota did when they decided to call them Scions. They were still Toyotas, you know. And I guess they were marketing to the young people. And they thought, oh, we'll have a new brand call it Scion. You know, what a bunch of nonsense that was. Because Toyotas are known for reliability. Why would you call them Scions now? Now, I understand why they made the Lexus brand. Because that's high-end. And people with luxury cars, a lot of them are snobbish. And oh, I drive the Lexus. They don't want to say I drive a Toyota. So that made sense. They made a lot of money on that. But going the opposite way, going for the kids, uh, what do they care? People like Toyotas. And now they still make the same basic cars, but they don't have the Scion brand. So that's kind of a dumb thing. But they're well-made cars. You can still get parts. And in your case, get whatever you want, what you like, because they're all reliable. Drive them and see which one you like more than the other. And, of course, it doesn't matter when you're buying a used car. Always have a mechanic like me check it out with our fancy scan tools that we pay thousands of dollars for. And we can tell a lot. I do that every week. I do it for a few people. And it takes me an hour of time of going through it all. And I show them all the information while I'm doing it. Then they know it's a solid car or not. Because you can't trust anybody buying a used car. Could be wrecked, flood, stolen. You don't know what happened to that car. So you want a mechanic to check it out before you buy it. Next question. DJ Chonga says, Scotty, what's your opinion of a Mazda B250 manual transmission pickup trucks? Okay, I'm not a Mazda fan, but they've always made decent pickup trucks if you get a standard transmission. I've got customers that bought them. Some of them have 300, 400,000 miles on them. They took care of them, and they were good trucks. Their automatic transmissions, pfft, they're garbage, but that's a standard transmission, and you can get them cheaper, and if you don't mind the way it rides, you like it, it could be a decent truck. Me, I go and buy a Toyota Tacoma, and I know they're going to run forever, but you're not going to get a good deal on a Toyota Tacoma most of the time because everybody likes them, and they know they're worth money, and they ask so much money for them used, so if you find a good one with a standard transmission, it might not be a bad deal at all. Next question. By Plav Achara says, what do you think about buying a used Toyota Venza? Are they as reliable as a Camry? Well, yeah, here's the thing about Venza. They don't make them anymore. I think that was more of a marketing mistake by Toyota because they didn't really know what that thing is going to be, where it is in their lineup of cars. It was relatively expensive, and, you know, it's got the V6 engine, it's got more power. But I personally think that the reason they stopped making them was because they were competing with their own Lexus lines of SUVs. And so they started to stop making them. Uh, they didn't have that big sales in them, but uh, there's nothing wrong with the Venzas. They can last a really long time. But they just, for some reason, marketing decided they weren't going to make them anymore. Uh, they cost a lot of money to make because a lot of them were all-wheel drive. And it's not that they had any particular problems being Toyotas, but they never were that big sellers, and they started, started, decided to stop making them. I mean, all companies make marketing mistakes. Uh, I personally am nuts about uh, my wife's old Matrix that I drive around now. And that was basically a Toyota Corolla. It was a small SUV. And then the Venza was basically a bigger version of that with a V6. And a lot of people with something like that, they were more into the four-cylinder engines. And then the people that wanted the big V6s, they got the Lexus SUVs because they got a better image and stuff. So that was just a marketing mistake. They're still, if you like them, they're excellent vehicles. They'll last just as long as the Camrys. Next question. 
Matt Carlin says, I live in Minnesota, where they salt the road. Where should I go to buy a car outside of Minnesota? Hey, come down to Texas or Arizona. I got people that do that all the time. I even, uh, my old roommate and college's ex-wife uh, married this guy out of Chicago. And what he did was he'd come down three or four times a year from Chicago to Houston with a car carrier. And he would buy, you know, eight cars or so. And he would pay less than $3,000 for each one. And he had a guy in Chicago that sold used cars. And he guaranteed to pay him like six grand for each car as long as they had the Texas tags and weren't rusted. And then he'd sell them for money up in Chicago. Why not come down here? Hey, with the internet the way it is today, uh, you buy something, you can just fly down to Houston. Or if you're real cheap, take a bus and then drive the car back. There's nothing wrong with doing that. A lot of people that do that these days because the transportation is so cheap these days. You can get down somewhere, buy a good car in another state and then drive it back. Come to Houston, say hi to me. <laughs> Next question. Omar Critchley says, is an 86 Ford Ranger a good buy? Five-speed manual for 1100 bucks. Okay, it's old as the hill. It's an 86, but those Ford Rangers were good pickup trucks. Could last a long time. And it's a six-speed, uh, a five-speed manual. So, you don't have to worry about the automatic transmission going out. I would say, drive it. Road test it. And if it road tests good and runs, doesn't smoke a lot out of the back, go right ahead. 1100 bucks isn't much these days. And if it still runs good... You can drive it, and everything on that vehicle is still available. You can fix the engine if it goes off. You can do all kinds of things. Next question. Tammy Lynn says, Scotty, what do you think of a rebuilt car? <laughs> okay, that's a big question here. It depends on what you mean by rebuilt. If you're talking about you're buying a car, and on the title, it has a rebuilt title or recondition, my advice is stay away from them. Because that means the car was wrecked, flooded, or stolen, or it was totaled by an insurance company. Then, by law, it has to say that it's got a rebuilt title on it. The, there's nobody, really, that goes and checks and sees it was rebuilt correctly here in the United States. It's just pot luck. So I would stay far away from it. Now, if you're talking about just a regular vehicle that has a clean title, but a guy says he had the transmission rebuilt or the engine rebuilt, demand to see the receipts, and talk to the guy who actually did the work to see if it's real or not. But if it's just on the title, stay away. That's a big mistake. I've had people buy them. They didn't know what it meant. Then they bring it to me and I hook up my computer. And it turns out that it's got like 36 trouble codes because it was flooded and all the electronics are going out. You don't want to end up with a vehicle like that. Next question. Colby Hankton says, I got a 99 Acura CL. When I drive, it feels like I have a flat tire on the passenger front tire. But it's not a flat tire. What else could it be? Okay. Now, it depends on your tires. If you have those low-profile tires, they often do strange things. If you have real high-end tires... First thing I'd do is say, put the front tires in the back and the back tires in the front. And if it goes away, just drive it that way. Now, if it stays exactly the same when you swap the tires, then you've got a suspension problem in the front. Jack it up. See if it's got play, if ball joints are worn or tie rods are worn. See if the strut's worn. I know a lot of times the strut mounts break, and when you bounce it, you'll see the top of the strut mounts. When you open the hood, it'll be cracked, and the rubber moves up and down. You need those. You need to check that, too. But first, put the front tires in the back, and the back tires in the front. See how it goes. Next question. Well, C says, what do you think about buying a used VW Touareg with 40,000 miles on it? Well, if you can get it for practically nothing, go ahead. But those Volkswagen Tourards are one of the highest maintenance cars in the world. Uh, 
it's basically, you know, it's got the same engine in it, most of them that the Porsches have in them. You know, Volkswagen owns Porsche, and they swap a lot of technology back and forth. They are endless money pits as they age. But that said, now I have had customers buy used Volkswagens for practically nothing, and they drove them for a couple of years, and they were okay cars because they do handle great. There's no arguing that. They're fun to drive around. But don't ever pay much money for one because they're endless money pits as they age and their resale value goes like a stone. So keep that in mind. Next question. Christopher Bowen says, is the Chrysler 300C Hemi any good? Well, the engine is excellent. That is an excellent Hemi engine. There's no arguing that. The problem is, it's in a 300 Chrysler, which has horrendous electronics, the ball joint problems, they have all kinds of problems as they age. All the customers of mine that got a Chrysler 300, when they first got them, they thought, oh, great car, well, I love driving. Because they were fast, they handled pretty good, I mean, they were fun to drive. But then, as they aged and got old, hoo-hoo-wee, to a man and woman, they all said, I would never buy another Chrysler product. So, the engine is good, yes, but the rest of the car, not so good. Well, that's it for today. Remember, every day of the week, I upload two videos on the Scotty Kilmer channel on YouTube. So, subscribe and hit that notifications bell so you get notified because they won't notify you anymore unless you do that. And I'm here every Saturday at 10 a.m. Central Standard Time answering your questions on YouTube Live. And Thursdays at 1 o'clock Central Standard Time in the afternoon. Not in the night, of course. I'm sleeping now. So, I'll catch you on Thursday.